Palm Sunday, thought that would give you a little different perspective. Today we're going to talk uh, the end of our series on Moses, we're going to talk about how it's never too late. Let me give you a couple things about next week, uh, 7 a.m., we will have a sunrise service outdoor over there with some chairs, you can even bring your own chair if you like a comfy chair, and uh, I can't promise our chairs are comfortable, but you can bring one, and uh, so that'll be outdoors over there, and then 9 and 10.30, uh, egg hunts after both of the morning services, so... Uh, you can join in. Uh, Brian, that's not for you. So, uh, but anyway, so here's the series verse I want to go back to. We've done it every week. Then the Lord said from Exodus 4, what is that in your hand? A staff, he replied. The Lord said, throw it on the ground. Moses threw it on the ground and it became a snake and he ran from it. So week after week, we've talked about Moses. We've talked about uh, what God was doing in his life, how he uh, uh, killed a man early on uh, in anger, how God uh, began to do miracles through Moses. And we get near the end of the story, and uh, basically we're skipping the 40 years in the wilderness. Sorry, you can read that book of uh, Exodus for you. But uh, uh, we skipped all of that, and we get near the end of Moses' life, and we start looking and we say, all that Moses did... And now he's going to be denied the promised land. I don't understand God. Let me ask you this question. You ever feel like it's too late for God to get a hold of someone? Maybe you know somebody who's very angry. Listen, maybe you know a Christian who acts worse than non-Christians. Uh, I used to work at Quincy's with my buddy here. And, and we would see people, and, and back then, a lot of the ladies that I worked with did not go to church. And they, a church would come in and they would say, that's a bad church, that's a good church. And it was based a lot on how the people from churches treated the people. Let me tell you something, people notice. So, so why are Christians so grumpy sometimes? And why do we think God can't change us? It's too late, I've always been this way. Maybe we have that Popeye syndrome, I am what I am. Actually, he said, I am what I am, right? It's just who I am. This is how I am. I, I've always been mean and grumpy in this. And so I realized something about me that I want to share with you as we get into this message. And I want to give you one illustration you can hang on to. See, when I was a kid, I worked for my dad. My dad owned a construction company in Miami. And from a very young age, he had me working for him. And the good news is I learned how to work hard. The bad news about working for your dad is you, your dad, not on purpose, you begin to equate I'm loved when I work hard, and I'm not when I don't. And many of us grew up that way, whether on purpose or on accident, but the truth is we start to equate that to God, and we think, I've got to work hard so that God can love me. You know, nobody else in this church works as hard as I do. I tell you what, God needs me. And I just make for a wonderful Christian person. But we've all had those thoughts and those attitudes. We've even washed dishes at our house in angry ways because we said, nobody does this. Isn't that just a pleasant person to be around? Somebody who's earning love? Here's the amazing thing about God. God's grace says that even when you don't sweep, he still loves you. But what happens when you really understand God's grace is you do the same thing, but with a different heart. You say, God... Thank you that I get to serve. Even if no one else does, God, I'm just going to serve you and do what you've called me to do. I'm going to love my neighbor. I'm going to reach out to people even when I get nothing in return because I know you've already given me everything. And I want to go back to Moses because Moses represents the Old Testament law and even Moses needed God's grace. So today I want to talk about how we can walk or how to walk in God's amazing grace because we fall short. That's our first point. Realize that we all fall short. So we're going to pick up in Numbers chapter 20. You'll have to forgive me today. I'm skipping around a little bit to make a point, but I'm going through the story. You'll have to get your Bible out and read the book of Numbers for yourself for this one. So the people are thirsty, they're complaining, they're whining. Moses has lost his sister. So he's grieving on top of everything else and dealing with grumpy people. And then it says this, He and Aaron gathered the assembly together in front of the rock, and Moses said to them, by the way, God had just told him, 
speak to the rock. Moses says, listen, you rebels, must we bring you water out of this rock? Time out. Moses now says, do we have to do that? Guess who was actually doing it? Was it Moses? No. What happened? Pride. Anger. By the way, those two typically go together, pride and anger. And so Moses did what we do when we get angry. He overreacted. Then Moses raised his arm and struck the rock. How do I know it was on purpose? Twice. You know, you could accidentally one time bump the rock. But if you're wailing it twice, guess what? It was not an accident. With his staff, water gushed out. By the way, God blessed it anyway. And the livestock drank. But the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, because you did not trust me enough to honor me as holy. What does that mean? God set apart. God was the one that was making this happen. God is the one that you should have been pointing to. But because you didn't, in the sight of the Israelites, you will not bring this community into the land I give them. Time out. I remember reading this and thinking, that is so unfair. 120 years, his whole life, based on leading the people in the promised land, and he gets almost there, and God says, you know what, you got angry one too many times. No. Wow. You know, it's been interesting this year and last year to see more and more big-name pastors falling. Some who, you know, some who you said, yeah, I never really liked them, but then other ones you went, oh, no. And what happened? Anytime we become prideful, think that we're better than other people, think that we're above sin, think that we're above accountability, we can fall and we can fail. And here's what we need to realize, that we all have the potential to fall and to fail. That's why we need confession and grace. You know, there's the principle of the sower. You reap what you sow, you reap later than you sow, and you reap more than you sow. And we love that when we've done something good, but we hate that if we do something bad. We sow and then we say, God, pull the weeds, right? But God is even better than that. Listen to what it says in Romans chapter 3, very familiar verses, 21. 24. But now, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been made known, to which the law, oh, that's Moses, and the prophets testify. This righteousness is given through working really hard. And if I just work hard enough, then God will love me more. And if I just, oh no, I messed up, so God doesn't love me. No, listen. Given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. And then it goes on to say there's no difference between Jew and Gentile. Why? Because all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified freely by His grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. See, we have a hard time understanding grace because most of us live by reward and punishment. And the more legalistic we are, we think the more right we are and the more angry we are. By the way, if you're angry a lot, you struggle with grace. One of the key factors in knowing if you're a gracious person is if every time something happens, you're offended and irritated and aggravated. You might need to start looking in the mirror instead of looking around you and wondering what's wrong with those people and start wondering, why am I not filled with God's grace? See, when Jesus sat with the Samaritan woman at the well, she tried to get in a political argument with him. Did you know that? And she says to him, you guys worship here and we worship there. And Jesus looks at her. He doesn't get mad. He doesn't get angry. He goes, well, the truth is, that's not going to matter soon. Next time somebody tries to get in a political argument with you, that would be a good answer, don't you think? You know what? That's not a hundred years from now. That's not going to matter. What really matters? What's important? If you grew up in a home where you were loved for what you did, and as soon as you got out of line, man, you you will think that God's that way, and you won't understand grace. And even me talking about grace bothers you, because you think, but what about the law? Well, I'm going to tell you about the law. Hello, come on in. Are you trusting your works 
or his redemption. You know, even, we always say that these religions, they always work their way to God. But if you're not careful, you become a Christian and then you think you're going to earn your way to God. It's the opposite. You should know that God loves you so much that it's a joy to serve. It's a joy to do what God wants you to. If you're always thinking, well, I got to do this for God to love me, then this is the kind of Christian you're going to become. But if you understand that he already loves you, then when you serve, it's out of joy and out of peace. And the fruits of the Spirit come naturally. Number two, recognize that God reveals his promises. God always shows us ahead what's going to happen. So this is what happens to Moses in Deuteronomy 34, 4 through 7. Remember, God wasn't going to let him in the promised land, but this is God's way of showing him the future. Then the Lord said to him, This is the land I promised on an oath to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob when I said, I will give it to your descendants. I have let you see it with your eyes, but you will not cross over into it. And Moses, the servant of the Lord, died there in Moab, and the Lord had said, and then I love this, he buried him in Moab. God buried Moses. Isn't that awesome? In the valley opposite Beth Peor, but to this day, no one knows where his, his grave is. If you look at Jude chapter 9, by the way, there's this really obscure verse where Satan argues with God, or Satan, argue, uh, Satan argues with an angel about Moses' body. And people say, what does that mean? And I go, I have no idea. Moses was 120 years old when he died. Anybody want to live that long? <laughs> you know, if you're watching online, I just want you to know the answer to that question was a little too loud. A little too loud. Moses lived to be 120 years old when he died. Listen to this. Yet his eyes were not weak. I, I've already messed that one up. Nor his strength gone. Moses was able to see the future. God showed him what was going to happen. You know, in the Old Testament, the Bible promised us in Zechariah 9 that a Savior would come into the city. And the disciples thought on Palm Sunday that what would happen is that they would come into the city and they would take over. Remember, they said, we want to sit on your right hand and your left hand where, when we rule. And he's like, mm, yeah, I don't think it's the way you think it's going to be. They thought they were kicking Rome out. They thought they were taking over. The next day, John 12, 12 through 15, the great crowd that had come for the festival heard that Jesus was on the way to Jerusalem. They took palm branches and went out to meet him, shouting, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the King of Israel. Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it. Now, I'm going to go back to that in a second. Hang on to that. I want to show you a couple other things. Do not be afraid, daughter Zion. See your king is coming, seated on a donkey's colt. That's from Zechariah 9, verse 9. In the Old Testament, they were looking forward to redemption. The reason that they celebrated Passover, Passover was not for them to say, we've got our act together and we're doing all these legal things. Passover was a way of them saying, we need a lamb to take our place. We need the blood over the door. The reason we take the Lord's Supper is that Jesus said, I'm the Passover lamb. He's the one who passed over us. By the way, this is not the first time Jesus came into a city on a donkey. His mom brought him in, if you recall, in Bethlehem, Luke chapter 2. If you remember also the foreshadowing of Jesus in Genesis 49 is when Abraham rode a donkey, and he was going to sacrifice Isaac. Isaac kept saying, hey, what are we going to sacrifice? And he said, God will provide. And he's thinking, it's you. But what did God do? God provided a lamb. When we together take the Lord's Supper, we remember that Old Testament Passover that the Jews, as they left Egypt, God had freed them. They were no longer servants. They were free. And even today, did you know, at Passover meals all over the world in the next few days, they will put a pillow behind them at the table to represent reclining. And if you read the story of the Lord's Supper, it says that the disciples were reclining at the table. Did you ever wonder why was that in there, reclining? Didn't they always recline? It's different. 
It demonstrated that they were no longer servants. They do it during Passover meal on purpose to show they're no longer servants. Remember who washed their feet? It was Jesus. Why? Because there were no servants other than Christ at the Lord's Supper. Thank God that he keeps his promises. So number one, we realize we all fall short. Number two, we realize that God reveals his promises. Number three, receive God's grace for you. You know, this week I had the opportunity to baptize one of our ladies. Sharon was baptized at their home in her pool this week. It was an awesome time of her saying, I want to take that next step of faith. We have baptism in a few weeks. People have already signed up and said, I want to take that next step of faith. Maybe I've become a Christian, but I've never been baptized the way Christ was. Every time you walk in obedience, it's a step of faith because of his grace. Not because you're strong enough or smart enough. Can I, can I give you a secret? Did you know the pastor doesn't have a hotline to God? I know that's a shocker. Some of you think, well, if I call Eric and he prays for me, that'll be better. Well, yeah, it's good to pray for each other. But the truth is, when I pick up the phone and when you pick up the phone to pray, God says, right here. Through Jesus, we all have access to God in prayer. Each step of faith is that acknowledgement of God's grace. In Matthew 17, we see Moses again. After six days, Jesus took with him Peter, James, and John, the brother of James, and led them to a high mountain by themselves. There he was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun, and his clothes became as white as the light. Just then, there appeared before them Moses and Elijah talking with Jesus. And here's compulsive Peter He's the reason they have to put tags on your blow dryer, right? Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If you wish, I'll put up three shelters, one for Moses, one for, Eli one for you, for Moses and Elijah. While he was still speaking, talk about correction, a bright cloud covered them. A voice from the cloud said, this is my son, whom I love, with, with him I'm well pleased. And then, listen to this, listen to him. Now, I... My wife knows that there are times that she has to say that to me. Listen to what I'm saying. This is important. Now, I know it's hard to believe that I get distracted. I know that's a shocker to most everybody who goes here to church, that occasionally I get off the trail. God was doing this to Peter. Hey, Peter, I'm pleased with what Jesus is doing. Listen to what he says. Are we listening? Are we paying attention? Because here's what just happened in this passage. Do you remember when we looked back at the Old Testament, Moses was looking into the promised land and died. And the next time we see him, you know where he is? He's in the promised land with the promised one. All of those sacrifices that were implemented during the time of Moses didn't represent the lamb healing them. It represented Jesus, the lamb healing them. And now here Moses is. God kept his promise to Moses. And now Moses is standing in the promised land with the promised one. Now, I don't know who you're praying for, who you think there's no chance. And I don't know if you've been a Christian so long that you just kind of angry serve. And you think, well, that's just how it is. I just got to get the gumption. I want you to know, God's grace can fill you with joy. God's grace can take you who are struggling with forgiveness and help you to forgive someone who doesn't deserve it. Now, I'm not saying that that means you need to let them in your life. I'm not saying that that means you need to let them continue to hurt you. But forgiveness means letting them go. And saying, God, only through your grace can I forgive that person. That's how good God is. In Ephesians 2, 6 through 8, it makes it very clear. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. In order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches, listen, listen, not of heaven, incomparable riches of his grace. See, it's hard for us to understand grace. Why? Because we think we have to earn it. 
We, we think we've got to do something. God says, no, no, I'm giving you the riches of grace through Christ. And then it continues, expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. Why? For it is by grace you've been saved through faith. It's not from yourselves. It's the gift of God. You don't earn your way to heaven. You surrender your way to heaven. You don't earn your way to God. You surrender yourself to Christ and he takes your sin. You don't work your way into the kingdom. Now, listen, faith without works is dead. I get it. But you don't do works to earn your way to God. You do works because of what God's done for you. And then you do it joyfully. You enjoy doing what God wants you to do. Why? Because you don't deserve it. Every day you serve, you go, even if that person's mean to me when I bring them soup, I just, Lord bless them. Even if I work in the nursery and that parent yells at me that I put that diaper on backwards, that's happened. Uh, you know, even if I go help that neighbor and I cut their yard and I say, Jesus, I want to do that in your name. And I hit that sprinkler and that neighbor's mad at me. That's never happened to me before. Even if I go to blow off my neighbor's front doorway with my lawnmower and don't realize that the welcome mat gets sucked into the lawnmower. And you have to buy a new mat for your neighbor that's $30. You joyfully do it because God has given you Grace, and you're not serving so that somebody else will be happy with you or that God will be happy with you. You do it because you know that God's love is in you. So you want to pour that out to other people. Does your Christian life look that way? Or is it angry? Is it frustrated? Are you irritated all the time? Maybe, if so, you're not really living in God's grace. Maybe you have forgotten. Maybe you've become an Xer in life instead of a checker. You know, elementary school Teachers, young teachers, preschool teachers are checkers. They go, good job, good job, good job, good job. And then we move into high school. It's, you got this wrong, you got this wrong, you got this wrong. And if we're not careful, we do the same thing. We look for what everybody's done wrong instead of looking at the blessing and what God's done right all around us. Have you received his grace through faith? When I was in college, there were guys who were <clears throat> major druggies. And I used to go surfing with them. And they were like, dude, we got to go surfing today, man. It's going to be awesome. It's going to be radical, man. And we'd go out surfing. And these guys were so far from God. And I would talk to them about faith in Christ. And they're just like, dude, dude just don't do all that stuff, man. It's just not. But you want to go surfing? So we'd go surfing. A few years ago, I was at a conference in Jacksonville. And all of a sudden, this guy walks up to me. No longer with long hair on his shoulders. So I didn't recognize him. He came up and he goes, dude, do you remember me? Totally did not look like that. And I thought, yeah. He goes, you wouldn't believe it, man. I gave my life to Christ. He straightened my life out. And now I'm here with a bunch of guys and I'm helping them straighten their lives out. And I'm like, dude. No, I don't need to say that. <laughs> I can tell you, if God could take that guy and transform his life, he can take your life that friend's life, that person that you've been praying for, he can radically change their life. So don't give up on praying for God's grace. That person that you're having a hard time forgiving, don't give up on praying for God's grace for you. That struggle that you're having, God, would you give me your grace to overcome by faith? Have you received his grace through faith? If you're here today and you're watching online and you've never given your life to Jesus Christ, you can do that today. The Bible says that God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes, whoever puts their faith in him, whoever surrenders to him will not perish but have eternal life. He did this not because he was mad at us, but because he loved us. God provided a way to him. Moses, even in the Old Testament, the bringer of the law could not keep the law. You and I fall and fail, and that's why we need Jesus. And if you want to surrender to him today, you can. I'd love to talk to you after the service, pray with you. And you can surrender your life to him. If you're watching online, you can send me an email, a text. You can talk about what it means to be a Christian. Normally, we go into our time of giving, but you can just give on your way out. If you're on, watching online, you can give online. We thank you for watching today. If you need prayer, we're here for you. We have a great song that goes with the sermon to close this service, but we're going to pray. Father, thank you for these moments. Thank you for your word, your power, and your will. 
Lord, I thank you for the people whose lives I've seen you change radically just this year in our church. And Father, the people who in my lifetime I've seen take steps of faith. Lord, I thank you for the people who serve joyfully, who've learned what it means to walk in your grace so that even when things don't go well, they smile and say, it's because of God's love that I'm here. And they walk in your grace. May we do that with each other and show others the light of your love. Father, I pray that we could always speak the truth in love, but always in your grace. Thank you that you came in grace and truth. Help us to balance those things. Lord, we love you this morning. In Jesus' name, amen.